Thank you all very much for joining us this evening uh, for our monthly community discussion, Let's Talk. Every month we pick a different topic. Uh, we are very happy to receive recommendations for topics for future meetings in case anybody has things to suggest. Very, very interested in hearing what it is that people would like to talk about. Um, and so I encourage you all to send your suggestions to questions at opdc.org for any uh, future uh, meeting suggestions uh, and or you're always welcome to drop anything into the chat. Uh, this, this evening's topic is about uh, community gardens uh, and uh, sort of what do we have in the way of community gardens in Oakland uh, and what kinds of available opportunities do we have uh, for expansion and for uh, digging deeper into the spaces that we already have available. Reporting in progress. <laughs> Apparently we're just being reported this way, that way, and up and down. And you're going to need to turn off the speaker. Yeah. Um, can we have a little bit of an echo? Uh, so I'm, I'm, my name's Andrea Boykowicz, and I'm the interim director at OPDC. I'm filling in this evening for Sam Gallagher, who uh, is ill and was not able to join us. Uh, and as I understand it, actually, uh, Mackenzie uh, Pleskovich from the city, I had thought that you were not going to be able to join us either, but I'm glad to see you here uh, under difficult circumstances. And uh, thank you all very much uh, for joining us. Um, uh, Sam had left it open a bit to as to how we would conduct this conversation, but as I understand it, we had rec representations here from Plant to Plate uh, as well as from the city. Thank you very much for joining us uh, to talk about uh, opportunities in the Adopt-A-Lot program at the city. Uh, and with that, I would love to be able to turn it over to the Plant to Plate folks. I have Scarlett and Avi here. Uh, and if you'd like to introduce yourselves, I'm gonna turn up your volume so that everyone here can hear you. Is that acceptable? Okay, we're good. Hi, my name's Abi. I'm Scarlett. Uh, we're both on the Plant to Plate board. Um, we've been in Plant to Plate for two years now, and we got involved as sophomores, and we're now seniors. Um, and we've worked with OPDC a little bit in the past um, when we were looking into the Adopt a Lot program, but otherwise, our operations have mostly just been within like the pig community, and then some work with the with uh, the CHS food pantry. If anyone here is unfamiliar with what we do, um, we are an urban garden located at the heart of Pitts campus, right on 246 Oakland Avenue. Um, we're completely student run, um, completely pit funded, <clears throat> and we aim to provide fresh grown produce to local communities through partnership with food pantries and other outreach opportunities. Um, so, I, I, sorry, I'm off campus, off, off camera as I'm asking you questions, but um, maybe you guys would like to talk a little bit about uh, how you go about recruiting your volunteers, what kinds of things uh, folks want to plant. Um, my understanding is that Plant to Plate has been struggling for a few years now with a certain amount of uncertainty, that you're not always going to have the Oakland Avenue spot. Uh, and the question would be, like, what other kinds of opportunities do students have? Uh, to garden um, in the different areas in Oakland. There's another spot potentially available to plant a plate, which might be up on top of the hill, uh, but would there be interest among the same community, for instance, in spots also in central Oakland, potentially in south Oakland? Um, how much appetite do you feel amongst your volunteers for uh, you know, greater involvement or more expanded or more varied kinds of sites? Yeah, the, so for context, um, our spot on Oakland Avenue was never intended to be a permanent garden. It's always been a part of Pitt's master plan to build greater overflow housing. Um, and in the past few years, Pitt as a community has kind of reached that population threshold where administration has put deadlines on our time with the garden and that's increasingly been moved back um, so like Andrea said, there is a lot of uncertainty there. We know we do have it for an additional year, I believe. We're guaranteed to have it through the end of 2024, but unofficially, um, based on our conversations with members of the Pitt student government and like through uh, administration a little bit, we know 
developing that land isn't really on their radar for at least like the next like couple of years. Uh, they recently started construction projects. They recently finished one at the cathedral like a year or two ago, and they're working on like a new student recreation center. So this is kind of like off their radar. So we know we have it for at least a couple more years. But um, in exchange for our garden on Oakland Avenue pit, administration has offered us a spot up on Vera Street. No one's going to know where that is because it's not really a real street. It's up by the um, like the baseball complex, um, like West Oakland area, kind of um, seeping into the Hill District. <clears throat> so right on the border there. And basically what we found through soil testing, through planning with different engineering groups, um, the land is like more or less non-viable for the scale of operations that we already <laughs> conduct on Oakland Avenue. So the transition would definitely be, for lack of a better term, a downgrade. Um, and we do have a very large operations base. If we were to quantify it, I would say 400-ish students, not regular. 400 <laughs> is kind of like a rolling amount because we have like a really high turnover of volunteers. And that's actually a good like transition into like your earlier question about how we do get volunteers. A lot of it is uh, very high turnover because one, like people are only here for four years and they may not hear of plan to play until their first or second year at Pitt. And two, like student schedules are very variable. So sometimes people will show up for like to every single event for two months and then we won't hear from them again for a couple months and then they'll show up again. And one of the challenges with the location of Vera Street on top of just like the poor soil quality is like, again, location. It's not close to where a lot of students live in Central and South Oakland. So working with other spaces is definitely something we were interested in. Yeah, to answer the final part of your question there, um, we have actually had some experience uh, just talking to the OPDC as well as doing our own research through Adopt a Lot on various like vacant lots owned by either residential owners or small commercial groups that have the future intent to develop. Um, and we kind of went through the process of drafting some outreach to them. Um, and that really never came to fruition in the last year. Um, but we would definitely be interested in that. We're already having some plans for some pocket gardens on Pitt's campus in the works. Um, and we'd love to implement that model wherever we can in Oakland. And then one more thing with the um, CHS garden, uh, the food pantry, the garden there, some members of Plan to Play kind of like diverge and form like a smaller group that gardens there. And they had a good amount of success this summer. Um, definitely some of the same challenges with finding a regular volunteer base, both um, over the summer when students might not be on campus or in Oakland. And then also uh, during kind of like there's like transitional periods, like the start of the semester or as like the weather starts to get colder, things like that. Uh, yeah, so that's been our experience working uh, with students who are interested in gardening also is that you're kind of missing during the peak of peak weeding slash uh, harvesting season. Uh, students generally are out of here by May and don't come back until the end of August. And that's an awful lot of knotweed that grows in the meantime. Um, so it is it can be really challenging to keep up uh, the maintenance over the summer. Um, and I imagine, but you guys do a pretty good job on the Oakland Avenue site. It's pretty uh, well loved over the summer and well attended. Uh, always been very impressed by that. Um, we have always a lot of interest or we, we field a lot of inquiries uh, at OPDC every fall uh, from new students who are just sort of looking for spaces uh, to say like, you know, isn't there another community garden or isn't there some space uh, that we might like to be able to take over? And I'm kind of curious to know, like to what extent is planted, plant, like I know that you guys are talking about like, you know, little pocket gardens and potentially diversifying and I totally appreciate that. What's your sense of like, what's the, uh, the potential um, of the organization and the interest base to really produce something, um, you know, in a long term, you know, more, greater, bigger, farther, diversified. Um, how do you feel about that? Honestly, I think that implementing our pocket model would be much more sustainable for the long term growth and upkeep of the club. I think 
and of community gardens in Oakland in general. I think what's difficult is not only, you know, is it this very central location that not all Pitt students can get to. Um, we do have a lot of people who live in West Oakland, who live in North Oakland. And then I think the other aspect of that is what we've always tried to kind of steer towards is a community centered approach. And we've always aspired to get more residential community members who are not students involved in the garden, or at least kind of introduced as a contact. Um, and we were exploring pursuing that through maybe a working relationship with Fraser Farms. But I think having pocket gardens in underutilized green spaces all throughout Oakland, not just where the students live, I think having that garden on campus can kind of deter that community melting pot that we really want to kind of move towards in future years. So I think Placing those pocket gardens more strategically might kind of take down that intimidating aspect that there might be when trying to form relationships between students and full-time residents. And then just to add on to that, um, like you said about kind of like the future of plant to play and within the community garden space in Oakland, um, what Scarlett and I kind of, one of the goals we had when we joined and became board members was we wanted to create more kind of like autonomy with our members um, because historically plant to plate plant to plates like success and activity has kind of been like driven by like just a couple people running the club and then however many volunteers show up. And I think we've made some progress in getting that goal. Um, our like newer or like more recent members and board members have been able to like set up a lot of things more independently, allowing like Scarlet and I to focus on more like bigger picture, long-term things. Um, like some of our one of our board members has set up like volunteer shifts with like Hilltop or Urban Urban Farm and other uh, outside of Oakland organizations. But I think it does make sense to do more even within Oakland just because one, like convenience and proximity and two, just building a stronger community, like Scarlett said. And I do think our members are hungry for that. I mean, so many people come to us, even not just our volunteers, like our direct club members. Um who attend all our meetings, we have so many people express to us the kind of desire to have their own project, to have something they can be responsible for, that they can be proud of. And I think that has been, from what we've seen, a really empowering thing for students. And we think that it has the potential to be a really empowering thing for community members as well. Well, thank you for that. I think that I agree with you. And, um... I think that there's not a lot of opportunity for us to talk about this maybe more strategically. Say, for instance, over the winter when you put your garden to bed and when we're looking into uh, new spots. And with that, I'd like to sort of stick a pin in, in this conversation right now and sort of pivot over um, and ask, Mackenzie, are you with us? Are you able to participate? Yes, I'm here. Hey, would you like to talk a little bit about the city's uh, Adopt-A-Lot program uh, and what kinds of city-owned assets we have uh, that we might, or, or what the process should be uh, for us to explore and identify um, city-owned lots that might be potential candidates for gardens. Sure thing. So the Adopt-A-Lot program was created in order to allow community members or students, whomever, who are interested in utilizing vacant properties that are owned by the city of Pittsburgh to develop a rain garden, a flower garden, or a food garden. And right now we have almost 80 throughout the city. In our records, there's one Adopt-A-Lot garden that's in West Oakland. It's located on Beeland Street by the Birmingham Bridge, which I recently visited. It's very active. It has flowers and plants growing. Um, there are a lot of city-owned vacant properties in West Oakland in that area, less so in South Oakland, and we don't have any properties in Central Oakland since it's very developed. But if you know, if Plant a Plate or other community members are interested in trying to identify potential Adopt-A-Lot opportunities in that area, lotstolove.org is a great resource for identifying vacant lots. Their map highlights all of the city-owned vacant properties in blue and all of the other properties like those owned by the Urban Redevelopment Authority, those are highlighted in green. So those could potentially be opportunities for central Oakland gardens. If they are owned by the URA, I know that they're trying to start a farm farm 
Farm a lot, I think it's called. Uh, so for this specific purpose, they have a similar model to the Adopt a Lot program, which they will be launching hopefully by the end of this year, which might be a good opportunity for you guys to use. I have personally requested from our city GIS department a map and a spreadsheet of all the city owned vacant property in the Oakland area that I can share with you guys. And um, I did look through as well some of the vacant properties in South Oakland and West Oakland where we do have sites. Most of those are partial hillside or would ideally be greenways because the topography is so steep. But there are two potential opportunities for smaller gardens that may be viable if you want to check them out. And I can also send those over as well in an email. Um, but I would encourage you to use the Lots to Love website to identify city-owned parcels and then visit them to see if they'd be viable. And then you can submit an intake form to us on the city's website. Our deputy director of city planning, Andrew Dash, is receiving those inquiries right now. And then we would help you through that process by developing an agreement. You'd have to obtain a soil test. But first, we'd talk to you about the viability of any sites that you're interested in before we move forward with that process. So that's just a general overview of the program and potential sites. Thanks so much, Mackenzie. How does this program differ from the city's community gardens program? Well, this really is our community gardens program. Okay. So yeah. for example, there is one city owned community garden as far as I know. I, I, if anyone knows of any others, then let me let me know. But in, in Oakland, which is uh, actually uh, currently on Lawn Street uh, in Oak Cliff, in South, where the city believes in South Oakland. Uh, and my understanding is that there's some ambiguity about its status because it has now been appended to uh, the future Lawn Street Greenway. And I'm wondering, um, is that like an administrative designation? Is that, you know, some kind of programmatic decision? Uh, or is, would that in any way uh, prohibit or impede us using that garden space on the corner of Elsinore and Lawn um, for the purposes of a community garden? Oh, well, I'm actually working with our Greenways Planner right now to identify additional greenways and also to establish potential uses of those areas because there are some areas in the city that aren't as hilly. They would be designated as greenways and could ideally be used at least partially as garden sites. Right now we don't have, you know, as the city we have limited resources, we struggle to maintain the greenways and parks that we do have. So trying to promote the Adopt-A-Lot program as a means of stewarding vacant lots and adding more gardens to the city with the assistance of community members and groups like Plant to Plate is really what we're geared toward. So I don't have a lot of information about any city-owned gardens. I don't believe that we're trying to activate any more of those. Okay. Um... I'm just taking a moment here to acknowledge a comment in the chat here from Candace, uh, who would like more information about uh, opportunities for community gardens in West Oakland. Uh, and I think this is something, uh, Scarlett and Avi, that we could talk about as well. Um, so I will follow up definitely after the call. But if anyone else is on the call hoping uh, for news about a potential site in your area of Oakland, could you please let us know? And uh, this is the kind of uh, information that we need in order to be able to put together, uh, you know, good advocacy from the community in collaboration with the ready and willing, uh, if maybe a little cyclical uh, labor that we have uh, in uh, from uh, Pitt's undergraduate population, which is uh, has always been a huge mover of um, energy when it comes to dirt. Um, uh, so <laughs> that's sorry, a rather a roundabout way of me showing appreciation both for. Um, uh, community members who are deeply invested in the future uh, greening and sustainability of the neighborhood, as well as uh, students who are interested in, in putting down uh, even temporary roots here, um, maybe literal, uh, just as much as figurative. Um, thank you so much for that, Mackenzie. As I understand it, also, um, we have Claire Madaway on the call from uh, Grove Pittsburgh. Claire, are you here? Potentially, and look. Sorry, I'm just kind of 
working off of some notes here. Um, no, it's not Candace. Um, well, okay, I just wanted to make sure that everybody on the call is aware of uh, Grow Pittsburgh's resources. Uh, and Grow Pittsburgh is a Pittsburgh-based nonprofit organization that um, is uh, dedicated to uh, education and support for uh, uh, gardening and community gardening as a kind of a community building practice. Uh, and among the things, for instance, that they offer uh, as a resource there are uh, is the Garden Resource Center uh, that has uh, a number of, um, you know, they, they offer workshops as well as they have a, kind of a tool lending library uh, and some technical assistance um, in putting together um, uh, volunteer, organ uh, volunteer events as well as, you know, some some guidance guidance about how to build raised beds and how to maintain uh, what kinds of plants do well in what locations. They have a lot of knowledge uh, that is a bit, you know, they're w willing and, and ready and eager to share with the community. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that people are aware of that. Uh, and if Claire does join, then we will uh, be very happy to see that. Um, uh, and I just want to make sure that people are. Uh, patient and forgiving of me because I just picked this up, right? If I'm missing anything that was on the agenda, if Sam had communicated with you that um, she would like for you to speak, I want to make sure that we uh, give everybody the opportunity to present resources or programs that they uh, are working on in this area. Okay. Um, with that, I would love to open it up. Does anybody have any questions or things that you'd like to talk about uh, in this context? Is there uh, a garden that is near you that you think needs some love? Is there a garden that is there not a garden near you where you want there to be love? Um, what kinds of um, what kinds of questions did people come here today, today with? Feel free to unmute yourself and just ask questions or talk. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, Scarlett and Abby, can you explain a bit more in detail the idea of pocket gardens? Definitely. Yeah, so the pocket garden initiative started a couple of years ago as like just like an idea um, after we were informed that we were given a deadline to move out of the garden, but the construction got pushed back. But when we were given that deadline, we thought if we don't have like a central garden space, maybe we split up and have some like more multiple smaller gardens. So that way um, a greater proportion of like the pit community is able to like be involved. And so recently that proposal was approved by administration and we have our first two pocket gardens, like in the development of like becoming functional. One of them is within a residence hall. And then one of them is in, um is actually across the street from our current garden in the backyard of uh the healthy home lab a uh mobility lab in pittsburgh and what that actually looks like as a model so bringing in a pocket garden would look kind of like identifying an underutilized space um and what we would bring in there would be some kind of like insulated raised bed or like any kind of small planting apparatus, um, as well as a small lockbox with the appropriate tools, um, identifying somewhere that has kind of viable water access, uh, good sunlight, um, and planting according to the conditions of the lot. Um, and it really can be whatever you know, the caretakers want it to be. I know we have, I think one is going to be focused more towards like a pollinator garden and then one might be more edible um, fruits, vegetables, that sort of thing. Um, but it really is easy and inexpensive to kind of implement in these small spaces. Um, granted that you take into account the proper specifications. And then um, just these pocket gardens would be kind of like customized based on um the uptake available um if we have a pocket garden in an area where we have like a regular consistent and large volunteer base 
then we could scale it up a little bit and have higher maintenance uh, things. But if we don't, then we would obviously plant lower maintenance crops or just like do like an herb garden or a pollinator garden. So it is really just whatever. It's just to maximize like the use of underuse space. Can you hear that question? The yeah. question was about whether or not the space, do you have any specifications about how flat or how level the, the, the area is, or do you have any other kinds of constraints? Yeah, it's honestly dependent on space to space. I know um, we were looking at putting in in one space that's flatter raised beds, but we're also doing one on a patio sort of thing. So we have these big raised planters on like kind of stilts for lack of a better word. Um, so really it is very customizable, especially on such a small scale. So we wouldn't be too concerned in that case about like any kind of hilly terrain or like soil quality because you know, we're really just dropping the garden in the lot. And then on top of that, um, we've ha done a little bit of work with student organizations in the past, like Engineers Without Borders and a couple other groups that also have community kind of like uh, service driven missions that would be able to lend themselves to this kind of work. Um, and I'm sure like they'd be happy to help and we can like network through the university to find people who would be able to make the most out of spaces that might not necessarily have the best conditions for a garden under like what you would kind of like imagine like a regular garden to be like, but we have like a lot of resources and people within the pit community um, that can kind of help us think outside the box and maximize the space. Maybe I missed it, but what alternative locations would the university suggest? Would they so the main alternative location that the university offered to us initially was um, a hillside slope kind of patch of land up on Vera Street. It's directly down the hill from, if you know where like the baseball field is off of like Aliquippa Street. Um, so it's down towards the hill district that way. Um, it was very underdeveloped. The university used it for salt storage, for road salt. Um, they, still do. they still do. So the conditions are probably as poor as you would imagine from putting road salt directly on the ground for years. Um, but, you know, there, it was very subject to erosion. It was really just like a dirt hillside. Um, and we went to the university and... Well, there's nothing <laughs> officially in the works yet, but because the construction at the Oakland Avenue garden site isn't really slated for the next uh, almost two years at a minimum, and it could potentially be more than that, um, some university administration has expressed that there's a chance. I mean, they haven't made any promises, obviously, but they've said that it's not outside the realm of possibility that we can find a more ideal space to kind of transition to when the university does develop our central location on Oakland Avenue. Uh, I have a question in that regard for Mackenzie. Um, there's a strip of city-owned property between uh, on, on John Kerr Street between the edge of Pitt's uh, back entrance to the business school and the John Kerr step. Um, it's currently just kind of like woody hillside, but it's all invasive and overgrown. Uh, and at various times, people have thought, wouldn't it be nicer if there were like a butterfly garden there? Or is there some way that we could like clear out the invasives and really help native trees to grow? It is it is on a slope, but it's not as steeply sloped as the site that you're describing in West Oakland. It's much more centrally located. Would that conceivably be a location that the city would consider allowing plant to plate, for instance, to locate some raised beds? If there's interest in that site, I would invite you to definitely submit an intake form for that location so that we can talk more about it. I know that some sites are located on slightly hilly topography, but if we have enough residents or community members who are interested in stewarding a garden on a site, it's really beneficial for, for us. We'd love to see that. So please do submit that if you're interested.
very cool. Um, there are a couple other city-owned sites up in West Oakland that are maybe less abused than the site that you're describing uh, and might be a little more accessible as well. Um, and maybe we can talk some more about, you know, the appetite for uh, combining plant to plates efforts with, for example, what Candace Gormley was describing, um, the some of the uh, interest in the neighborhood in, in having a viable community garden um, on an accessible spot. Um, so we'd love to continue that conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, forgive me for putting you on the spot, but Elena Zaitsev, I'm seeing you on the call and I know that um, the Oak Cliff Community Organization has had um, some discussions in the past about the, the fate of the uh, Lawn Street Community Garden. I was wondering if you had any um, input from uh, OCO about uh, how you feel about that spot. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I don't have a lot of input um, in the like division of labor. The um, the garden has not been one of the um, areas that I take part in. And the person who does, Greg Fisher, could not be on this call, but I made, he said, you know, I'll try to get a recording. And I made him aware that your recordings, you know, are on the Let's Talk, OPDC Let's, Let's Talk um, website. So that's that's about all I know. I I think yeah. the consensus is we don't want to lose it as a garden, and um, you know to have it, even though it's part of the Greenway, you know to have it as a garden. Greg is really the only one I know of who is um, using it. He clears it, you know, he tends it. I think he has some planting there, but I haven't even gone down and looked at it to tell you the truth. I'm sorry. Elena, Joan went over. I got yesterday. Can't hear you. Liz is saying that Joan went over to the to the garden site uh, yesterday or the day before. Okay. It needs work and needs a soil testing, but she's no different. It was very viable. I I all I heard I was think that, that it was pretty viable and viable. and might need some soil testing. Uh, but that okay. it, it didn't seem to her to offer any immediate obstacles as to why it couldn't be a community garden still. I I agree. Um, so we can, you know, we'd be happy to look into it further. I think that's about all I can, you know, say. No, we haven't talked about Fraser Farms yet. Do you have an opinion about Fraser Farms? Do you want to have any, you want to share any of that here? Or do you want to... Yeah, um, first of all, five or six spots of the Okay. And I don't know who I talked to, but I know that I give them a spot there. But um, the public here over there is pretty a lot of stuff. It's a different way of the spot over And the cars that were planted are overgrown on the beach. Right. Jamming down the beach. I mean, they're growing in the garden, and they have vegetables there too. I mean, it's, it's a weed patch. Right. I mean, I know what I'm talking about. I was raised on a farm, plus that yep. one of the suburbs I have a garden in every place. When I was in California, I was by a 50 foot garden. So, I, I soil is not being, is really tired, worn out. I mean, there's no, I mean, I brought a straw to plant potatoes in. Mm -hmm. And that's to nurse the soil more. Mm -hmm. I mean, the soil is not even moist when it rains, after rains, it dries out a little bit. So, I have a question for plant to plate in that regard whether you guys have composting as part of the educational programming that you're offering on Oakland Avenue, and if you'd have any recommendations for community gardens that want to be able to strengthen their, you know, the uh, soil amendment system <laughs> that they have in place what kinds of things have you guys learned yeah so we do have a compost system but before i get into that um can i i didn't really catch uh i'm uh, sorry david was talking about the fraser field at fraser farms uh which is down on fraser street at okay the, yeah um right about at dawson and, and fraser um right next to 
uh, the Fraser Field House we're, next to we're Dan Marino Field. Fraser Farms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I mean, as a backstory for everyone on the call, right? So Fraser uh, Fraser Farms had been uh, very closely monitored uh, uh, by a long-term resident and her family who were directly adjacent. Um, uh, she unfortunately died uh, two years ago, and since then, the sort of disposition or the governance of the farm has been a little bit uh, less certain, and there's been some, um, you know, it's not clear who's actually holding the rake, as it were. Um, so we're going to have to, I think, help out there uh, in terms of figuring out, how, you know, a better way of, of keeping track of that. Uh, but it's a great location, and, and there are students who live there as well as many permanent residents who would like for those gardens to be, uh, you know, uh, more useful uh, to, the, to the community. So uh, David was just pointing out that there are a number of the plots there are uh, either unplanted completely or not well tended uh, and overgrown. Yeah, so... Yeah, before we get into the compost thing, I would just like to say if we can be of any service as a club, as an organization, we would absolutely love to lend our materials, our resources, our manpower in any way that the residents see fit. Um, we've always really admired Fraser Farms as a space. Uh, we've been quite a few times um, and Part of our conversation with the OPDC was we wanted to kind of reach out and form that relationship in a way that was as respectful as possible, that honored the legacy of the garden um, to the fullest extent. Uh, so we do just want to make ourselves wholly available going forward um, as an organization. Um, and Abhi can speak more to the <laughs> compost question. But... So in terms of compost, that's actually something we have had trouble with in the past. Uh, we right now have one pile and it's gone big enough to the point that like it's been a, tr a trouble to maintain and that like it's not exactly usable in the sense that I mean I don't know how much you guys know about composting but one of the goals for composting if you want to compost um, like garden scraps and waste is that you want to get it hot enough to kill any like seeds so that way you can use that compost in your beds but we have had trouble like maintaining our compost to do that so we've kind of been limited in our use um one of our plans is to instead of having one big compost uh like compost pile we want to try to divide it up into tumblers and smaller piles so that way we can make maintenance easier so if you're trying to get composting done at fraser farms or any um community farm i'd say my advice, my two cents would be to like start small and scale up slowly because it can get a little bit tricky to maintain pretty quickly. I think the other issue we've really had, um, and this might be just a side effect of how central our garden is in a student dominated community. Um, we've had some issues with people just misusing the compost pile as garbage, putting cardboard in there, and it's very difficult for us to break down. We've had to restart it several times. So um, I think we would recommend erring more on the side of splitting it up into smaller, more discreet operations. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Um, <clears throat> I think there's some opportunities at Fraser Farms, potentially also. Um, uh, you know, with community uh, input and consent uh, on Lawn Street, uh, maybe also at the South Oakland um, uh, Orchard, which is on Parkview, slightly more shaded spot, but where there is there are some um, uh, some perennial fruit-bearing uh, trees and shrubs. So I think there's some blueberry bushes and um, some raspberries, but similarly unloved for a while and could use some better attention. Uh, might be an opportunity to to really um, put all of the resources that we have together in a concerted way and and make those spaces more useful. So that's super helpful. Um, I want to make sure that the folks here in the room have the opportunity to weigh in uh, also here and ask if any of you have any questions or any um, thoughts about gardening, anything that you've learned um, or heard in the community at large that you want to share. I think that was one of the things. I would just say that we have our lovely open community about things that you need in terms of volunteers 
of our students and some help with guards and getting word out with lots of things in the ground and off ground and going like that. So very happy to help with that thing. But I'm Brandon Boone. I am a uh, resident of West Oakland. And so um, whenever you guys are talking about the Ferris Street piece, um, it, it piqued my curiosity. I'd actually inquired about it a while back, but um, I completely understand the salt scenario there. Um, my actual interest, uh, so gardening is, is uh, is, is kind of a secondary reason I was um, here tonight. Pollinators. Are you guys tied into pollinators or efforts for pollinators throughout the, the community? And I, like, I'm just going to throw it on the table. I, I would desire to have a honey beehive. Like, that's kind of where I was looking at. And I realize that's a loaded question. Tons of tons of risks that may come with that. Um, but yeah, I was just curious what interactions or, or efforts there were on pollinators. And I'll open it up. Okay. Yeah, I love that question. Yeah. Not loaded at all. Um, are there any additions before we speak on? All right. Okay. Um, so in terms of pollinators, we actually do have a pollinator garden on site at our Oakland Avenue Garden. Um, and we've done this through partnership with a sustainability class at Pitt, uh, led by Dr. Corey Flynn. Um, and she is a great community resource for anyone interested in food insecurity and gardening. Um, and she's been a major advisor to our club, but her and her students every year actually repopulate a native wildflower garden um, that serves as kind of like the ideal little pollinator garden so we do have a very accessible model to follow for that um if we wanted to implement that anywhere else um in terms of beekeeping i don't know if we could speak on that but i think Corey would have some contacts yeah um in terms of beekeeping i don't know how likely that is for us to be able to do that through the university given like the risks um that might just be a liability thing, but pollinator garden definitely in play. And in terms of beekeeping, um, I actually have a contact that Corey connected, planned to play with in the past. Um, they're part of an organization called Wild Ones. Uh, we, Corey knows the two people who founded the Western Pennsylvania chapter of it and pollinators and native, uh, na like taking care of native bees and other native pollinators is something that they're very driven about. Um, if you can give me your contact information, I can definitely connect you with them and we can explore doing that. Maybe not at like a pit garden, but one of the community gardens, that's definitely something we can explore. Yeah. Yeah. I can certainly give me to give it to you afterwards. Just shoot across to you. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fine. Just over okay. Zoom. Something. Yeah. I'll get connected. Yeah. Thank you. We'll put everybody together. And um, can you give Corey Flynn's the spelling of her name? I'm sorry. The spelling? Yes. It's C O R E Y. Mm -hmm. And her last name is F L Y N N. I was right. Okay, cool. Thank you. I will reach out and I will connect because I think that, that could be helpful uh, as a resource for uh, not just the students, uh, possibly also for her students in looking for additional sites. Um, so, yeah, that sounds like we have some work to do. <laughs> I, mean, I know the Friendship Church on Robinson, that side area, their garden has been working on a house all year, so that's going to be coming back up. A couple of places. Yeah, uh, I really do appreciate everybody's extremely excellent um input here and I, I'm really grateful to you guys for coming out and for um putting uh having input. I want to make sure that everybody who had a who had a question or wanted to um had an idea had a chance to actually share that. Um feel free anybody to unmute yourselves and jump in. We just have one more quick announcement actually. If possible. Sure. Um, so this weekend, um, September 24th, September 24th, September 24th 
Uh, we have an annual harvest festival that we host as a club at our garden on 246 Oakland Avenue. Um, it is noon to four. Noon to four. It's a community event. It's really not intended to be a student opportunity. Uh, we do want to kind of invite everyone and encourage everyone to invite fellow community members. There will be food trucks. There will be live music vendors there will be baby goats a pet a little did baby. you say baby goats <laughs> we did say baby goats there will be baby goats um and all kinds of good camaraderie we'd love to talk to anyone who comes out whether that be about something we discussed here or something else that you have any ideas about or questions about we will both be there all day and we encourage everyone to come out and enjoy the good vibes and talk to us. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to see you guys there. Thank you so much. Well, Elena, I saw you unmuted yourself. Did you have also something you wanted to say? I do. And I don't know if this would be um, a good spot or viable at all, but I know um, that, you know, there's been talk about the Heron Hill pumping station site. Uh, I'm not familiar with the site at all. It might be all shaded, um, but it is a, it is city owned, correct? It is to be owned, and Mackenzie, um, maybe that's something that you could speak on. It's uh, the site that we're talking about is the green area that is around the Heron Hill pumping station. The pumping hill station itself, excuse me, the Heron Hill pumping station itself is still in use by PWSA, but there is about an acre and a half around it and behind it. Uh, that is owned by the city that is currently unutilized. It's mostly trees, uh, but I think that there are some spaces in there that do get some sun, uh, and it might potentially be uh, a space for a garden. And I, I wanted to know, Mackenzie, would there be a special process for submitting a proposal for that area? I'll drop my email address in the chat, and you can reach out to me with the location and additional information about it, and I can find out for you if it's a viable site. Mm -hmm. Great. That's a good tip then, Elena. That's a, a good reminder. Um, it's part of the Oakland plan. Uh, among the, that, That's a site that is among uh, a, a couple others that have been identified in Oakland as a, as a place for a future community service hub. The auxiliary building there um, is not used and it could be adapted to provide space for programming um, for a, a bunch of different uses you know, in North Oakland, uh, but the grounds around it is also one of the things that makes it an attractive option. So we could probably get started on that sooner rather than later. So thank you, that's a good tip. Uh, if no one else has anything else, um, I wanna thank you guys very much for coming. Uh, Planted Plate, Mackenzie, very much for, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking time out of your evening uh, and for sharing your information with us. And I'm really grateful to all of you who showed up here as well. Uh, and if you have further questions, please don't uh, hesitate to ask. Uh, you can always send questions or comments to questions at opdc.org. Uh, uh, reach out to us via our website as well. And if you're interested in uh, being part of a further conversation, say, for instance, later on this fall, early this winter, uh, about future sites for garden development uh, in Oakland, then please let us know, because I have all kinds of new ideas, and I'm really grateful to you guys. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for coming, really. And thank you all again. Have a really lovely evening. Bye. Thank you all. Have a good one. Thanks, Devon. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Good night.